All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Thanks for coming. Um, I will turn it over to Dr. Levin to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Today, we're joined by Dr. Amanda Leiter, who received her MD and Master's of Science in Clinical Research here at Mount Sinai, followed by both Internal Medicine and Endocrinology Research Track Fellowship here as well. Dr. Leiter is a T32 Fellow in Cancer Prevention and Control and an instructor in the Division of Endocrinology on the Clinical Investigator Track, and received the Agena Physician Scientist Award at Mount Sinai. Dr. Leiter is a health services researcher focusing on optimizing clinical outcomes in patients with metabolic diseases and cancer. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Leiter. Thanks so much for having me. It's um, very exciting to be here um, as, you know, I'm a Sinai lifer, and so I'm really happy to be speaking here today. The title of my talk is The Impact of Diabetes on Cancer, Not Just Another Comorbidity. I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, by the end of this talk, you should be able to describe the epidemiologic links between diabetes and cancer, identify cancer treatment complications linked to diabetes, and review how a cancer diagnosis can impact glycemic control. My presentation will review how diabetes affects cancer and how a cancer diagnosis impacts diabetes. As we all know, diabetes and cancer are significant public health problems. Um, the prevalence of diabetes has been increasing steadily. This is the most recent CDC data from 2016 that shows that the total um, frequency of diabetes is 13%. And this frequency, frequency is even higher in older adults with a frequency of 24% in adults age 65 and older. Cancer is the uh, second leading um, cause of death in the United States after heart disease. And diabetes is on the top 10 list as well. And um, cancer is now emerging as a leading cause of death in patients with diabetes. This figure shows death rates by cause in those with and without diabetes in 2001 and 2018 in the UK. Um, the blue shade, um, here are, um, is death from cardiovascular diseases. And as you can see, death from cardiovascular disease has declined quite a bit over time in patients with diabetes. Well, death from cancer, which are in these, uh, um, the red shaded boxes here has largely remained stable. And because of this, cancer has emerged as the leading cause of death in patients um, with diabetes. In people without diabetes, we've seen um, similar declines um, in cardiovascular death and um, and a little bit more of a decline in cancer death. And so cancer death is now making up a higher proportion of deaths in people without diabetes as well. First, I will discuss what we know about how diabetes affects cancer. Um, diabetes is known to increase the risk of many types of cancers um, and influences cancer pathogenesis cancer treatment outcomes, and cancer mortality. I'm first going to discuss about, uh, discuss how diabetes affects um, cancer risk. Um, supporting a diabetes cancer link um, is this, um, some interesting data that just came out of Sweden. Um, um, diabetes remission after bariatric surgery is linked to lower cancer incidence. Um, this figure comes from a Swedish randomized control trial um, of patients um, who were obese, um, either randomized to bariatric surgery versus conventional obesity treatment. Um, and durable diabetes remission, which is indicated by the orange line, um, was associated with a 60% reduction of cancer risk. And what was interesting in this study is that dur diabetes duration prior to surgery or remission was not associated with cancer incidence. Diabetes is linked with the incidence of many of the deadliest cancers in the United States. Um, this is a figure showing the 10 most deadly cancer types for men and us. And independent of body mass index and in many um, large retrospective um, data sets, um, diabetes is known to increase the risk of breast cancer, colorectal cancer, um, endometrial or uterine cancer, um, liver and intrahepatic bile duct cancers, and especially cholangiocarcinoma, um, and as well as pancreatic cancer. 
And interestingly, um, diabetes um, is known to decrease um, the risk of prostate cancer. This is a trend that's widely seen um, in the epidemiology data. And there are many theories as to why this may, may be the case, which I won't get into in too much detail. Um, but one potential um, explanation is that um, men with diabetes tend to have lower circulating androgens or testosterone and androgens are often what drive prostate cancer growth. Uh, as we know, there are many challenges to these epidemiologic studies, and we see very compelling trends that diabetes increases the risk for these discussed malignancies. However, it's hard to adjust for all important com um, confounders um, and a lot of national and worldwide data sets um, don't have details regarding important risk factors, especially regarding smoking data, which is very important for lung cancer in particular. And another issue too, is that there's not a lot of nuanced diabetes information to give much guidance regarding mechanisms. Um, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality in the U.S., and even though it is not a cancer that has been linked with diabetes, it is the cancer associated with the most mortality in patients with diabetes. And the relationship between diabetes and lung cancer incidence has been conflicting in past studies, mostly with the null association, but some studies showing higher risk and some studies showing lower risk. In general, studying metabolic disease in lung cancer is complicated due to um, the obesity paradox. Patients who have um, lower BMI actually have um, a higher risk of lung cancer. But there's been some interesting um, evidence um, coming out that increased abdominal obesity or waist circumference as well as metabolic syndrome are um, linked to increased risk of lung cancer. And these are um, markers of insulin resistance. Um, all of these previous studies weren't powered to look at lung cancer specifically, and were very heterogeneous regarding adjusted factors in their model and goals known to be important in lung cancer risk models. And part um, particularly lacking was quantification of smoking. So smoking duration and, um, and quantity are very important um, um, parts of lung cancer risk. Um, there's also limited details on lung cancer, de um, limited data on lung cancer detail, details like histology type. And lung cancer um, is actually a heterogeneous disease. So the major histologic ca categories are small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And within non-small cell lung cancer, squamous cell um, carcinoma and adenocarcinoma are the two most common subtypes. And lung cancer subtypes um, vary in how they respond to high glucose levels. There's preclinical data that shows that squamous cell carcinoma has elevated glucose transporter one relative to adenocarcinoma and is more reliant on glucose metabolism for growth compared to other types. Um, in um, some retrospective studies, a, a high glycemic index diet has been associated for a higher risk of squamous cell carcinoma, but not adenocarcinoma and um, predisposition to insulin resistance is associated with squamous cell carcinoma. So um, given that prior studies looking at diabetes and lung cancer risk didn't include detailed smoking data for the most part or have information on histology, um, we did a study using the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian um, screening trial. Um, this is a prospective study that um, includes detailed information um, regarding validated lung cancer risk factors, um, including very detailed smoking histories, and um, had an, and also with excellent lung cancer ascertainment data, including histologic subtype. In this study, we looked at about 150,000 patients, um, and um, accounting for all of these risk factors, we did not find a, an associ association between diabetes and lung cancer. Um, we also looked at um, histologic subtype, and we also found that um, diabetes was not associated with lung cancer subtype. Um, I now um, want to briefly review um, um, some of the mechanisms um, regarding how diabetes affects cancer. And uh, through epidemiologic studies, we know that diabetes is a well-established risk factor for many types of cancer. 
This figure is from a review paper from my mentors, um, Emily Gallagher and Derek Leroy. Um, this is a very complicated figure, uh, but I just wanna highlight that diabetes can encourage cancer growth in many different ways. And during this talk, I will be focusing on diabetes, um, but I wanna mention that obesity is also linked to cancer and um, both due to its association with diabetes um, as well as um, through other mechanisms. And I first wanna highlight um, that high insulin levels and in preclinical studies um, have been shown to increase tumor growth um, through both um, direct pathways through the insulin receptor, um, as well as indirect pathways um, through IGF-1. Uh, patients with diabetes are more likely to be diagnosed with cancer 10 years prior to a diabetes diagnosis. The 10 to 15 years prior to a diabetes diagnosis are characterized by increasing glucose levels, as well as increasing insulin resistance and increasing insulin uh, levels. And as diabetes progresses, um, an insulin deficiency develops, but insulin resistance remains and um, glucose um, continues to go up. Um, and um, this timing of cancer within the 10 years prior to diabetes diagnosis supports that um, high insulin levels um, play a central role in cancer development. And there are obviously issues that may explain this phenomenon besides high insulin levels like reverse causality, but I, um, I do think this contributes to the um, overall evidence that it, um, insulin um, plays a, a role um, you know, at, the, um, at a clinical level. Um, further supporting the role of hyperinsulinemia in cancer um, is um, that high insulin levels um, are associated with both cancer incidence and mortality. Um, this figure is um, from data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, the red um, line indicates patients that had high insulin levels, and this is a Kaplan-Meier curve just showing that um, patients with high insulin levels had more cancer mortality relative to patients without, um, uh, without high insulin levels. Um, I now want to talk a little bit about how hyperglycemia affects tumor growth. Um, the idea that glucose may impact cancer growth um, originated with Otto Warburg in the 1920s. He noticed that cancer cells and as well as proliferative tissue metabolize glucose differently the non-proliferating cells. This figure is a schematic of the Warburg effect. And um, as probably all of you remember from biochemistry, in the presence of oxygen, um, differentiated tissue and normal cells um, convert glucose to ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. And then in the absence of oxygen, anaerobic glycolysis um, occurs where glucose is converted into lactate. Um, Warburg found that in proliferative tissue or in tumor cells, regardless um, of the presence of oxygen, glucose is converted to lactate. And he called this aerobic glycolysis. And this is the Warburg effect. Um, over time, there has been a lot of controversy about this mechanism. Um, but the historical significance of Warburg is that he really highlighted the relationship between cancer and metabolism, and that cancer cells have metabolic derangements that may provide insights into how cancer pro proliferates and may explain why high glucose levels um, might um, play a role in cancer growth. Um, and just a side note, um, I saw this article in the New York Times a couple years ago about Otto Warburg, and I didn't realize what um, a fascinating um, person he was. He actually uh, was um, a gay scientist of Jewish descent that lived um, in Nazi Germany. And, and this article is a review of a biography that was written about him that sounded pretty interesting. Um, hyperglycemia can affect cancer growth in many ways. Um, so this is just a review of some of the mechanisms. And I just want to highlight that hyperglycemia can um, drive cancer cell proliferation, um, can reduce um, cancer cell apoptosis um, and increase cancer cell migration and invasiveness. So um, next I want to discuss how diabetes can affect cancer treatment outcomes. 
Um, patients with cancer and coexisting diabetes have unique considerations that impact the risk benefit ratio of cancer treatment. Um, we provide cancer treatment, obviously, to prolong survival and also improve symptoms. Um, and these are the major benefits. Um, however, patients with diabetes um, have, um, ha have issues that may decrease the benefit of cancer therapy. So patients with diabetes have more adverse events um, or complications from their cancer treatments. And they also have competing risks of death, mean meaning that they're um, at increased risk of dying of something else besides their cancer. And this competing risk of death um, takes away from the potential benefit of cancer therapies. Um, I'm going to talk about some of um, the adverse events that occur in patients with diabetes. And this, these can occur with both surgery um, as well as chemotherapy. So patients with cancer and coexisting diabetes have increased morbidity as well as mortality from their cancer surgery. And this isn't unique to cancer surgery. It's pretty well known that diabetes in general um, is associated with worse um, surgical outcomes. Um, so patients um, with diabetes and cancer are more likely to have postoperative mortality after their cancer surgery. Um, this is a meta-analysis of 15 studies um, looking at um, post-surgery mortality in patients with diabetes versus patients without. And patients with diabetes had um, almost double the odds um, of having post-operative mortality. Patients with diabetes are also more likely to have um, infections um, after surgery. Um, this table is from a meta-analysis of patients um, who um, got um, colon, colonic resection after colorectal surgery. And as you can see here, um, patients with diabetes had almost double the odds of both surgical site infections as well as intra-abdominal abscess after surgery. Um, this, is a, um, a, this is a table from a, a study of, of breast cancer. And um, this study looked at um, infection risk after different types of breast cancer surgery. And as you can see here, diabetes um, increases the risk of, um, of both superficial and deep incisional infections um, with partial and total mastectomies. Um, diabetes is also um, associated with a prolonged hospital stay um, after surgery. And um, this, um, um, this is important because this, you know, increases the cost of um, cancer surgery by quite a bit. And this is a study um, from uh, looking at um, low, uh, prolonged length of stay after a lobectomy for lung cancer. And as you can see here, um, diabetes um, was one of the strongest risk factors for prolonged um, length of stay in addition to renal dysfunction. Patients with cancer and coexisting diabetes also have increased morbidity from, um, uh, from chemotherapy. And I'm going to focus specifically on um, platinum chemotherapy, which is commonly used in a lot of different types of malignancy. Um, patients with diabetes are more likely um, to have neuropathy from their platinum chemotherapy. And um, as many of you know, um, neuropathy is a complication um, of diabetes, and this can often be exacerbated um, by chemotherapy. Um, this was a study that compiled clinical trial data on platinum therapy in patients older than 65 years old. Um, it looked at about 1,500 patients with um, a few different types of malignancy. And um, this figure shows um, the rates of grade two to four neuropathy by disease category. And um, diabetes um, was, asso had, was associated with um, increased um, rates of neuropathy um, with complications and just any diabetes as well. Uh, so um, diabetes is also associated um, with increased nephrotoxicity from platinum chemotherapy. And this may be due to you know, underlying increased risk of kidney disease um, in general in, in patients who have diabetes who aren't getting chemotherapy. Um, and, this, um, and this is a figure from a study looking at 250 lung cancer patients receiving cisplatin. So actually all of these patients have um, had heart disease and this First is just heart disease with no other comorbidities. This is heart disease along with um, hypertension and heart disease along with diabetes. 
Um, and as you can see, the um, prevalence of um, cisplatin-related nephropathy was about 30% in patients with diabetes. And this gray column is just um, showing that in patients who had to discontinue their platinum chemotherapy, um, the, um, at the rate of nephrotoxicity was up to 80%, which isn't surprising. Patients um, with diabetes are also more likely to be hospitalized um, um, due to chemotherapy toxicity. And this also increases the cost of therapy quite a bit. Um, so th um, this is a study looking at 70,000 patients um, who received chemotherapy for their breast cancer. Um, and as you can see here, diabetes was associated with an increased odds um, of, of hospitalization just in general of any toxicity, um, at hospitalization from any toxicity, as well as hospitalization for infection, um, neutropenia, and anemia. So we know that diabetes is associated with increased harms from cancer treatment. And the question is, how do we optimize cancer outcomes in patients with diabetes given this information? Um, the issue is that clinical trials of cancer interventions haven't specifically studied patients with diabetes and generally include younger patients with fewer comorbidities. As we all know, um, clinical trials generally include a healthier or a relatively healthier population. And in fact, a lot of um, the cancer therapy clinical trials exclude patients with diabetes who have a hemoglobin A1C that's greater than eight or have any sort of vascular complication from their diabetes. Um, I now want to introduce um, a simulation modeling. Um, it's an alternative comparative effectiveness to technique to randomized clin clinical trials, and it's a way of consolidating existing data and extrapolating um, findings to understudied groups. Uh, I now want to provide a brief introduction of simulation modeling for patients with lung cancer and comorbidities. And um, this is some of the work that uh, my research group is working on. Um, so in micro simulation, um, there is a simulated cohort of patients with cancer that are generated who are then randomized in silico to treatment arms and then followed um, to assess their outcomes. So for example, let's, uh, let's say a patient with lung cancer gets um, lobectomy um, for their surgery. And after that, they can either be randomized to observation or to adjuvant chemotherapy. And then this, the slide gets a little bit complicated here, um, but essentially once patients are randomized, they can transition to different states. So for example, it's in someone who gets adjuvant chemotherapy in the model, they can get an adverse event and then there's the state um, alive with an adverse event. And from this state, they can tr transition to still being alive with an adverse event, um, dying from, uh, from lung cancer or dying from a non-lung cancer cause. And the probabilities of transitioning from one state to another in the model are informed by um, existing data. So they can be informed by clinical trial data, the literature, or analyses of large population-based data sets. And in looking at patients with comorbidities, these analyses of large population-based data sets are what are largely transforming, uh, informing these transition probabilities since these um, data sets have um, information on patients and, out and their outcomes um, in the setting of comorbidity. I now wanna introduce some of the work I've started modeling diabetes and lung cancer. Um, so um, I created a preliminary model of stage two to three A non-small cell lung cancer. And th this is just a very, you know, a preliminary simplistic model, but I just wanna um, show this to you to demonstrate, you know, what the output from a, a simulation model looks like. Um, we looked at adjuvant chemotherapy versus observation post lobectomy, like the previous um, figure that I showed you. And we looked at patients um, older than 65 years um, with diabetes. Um, parameters that informed our model and the transition probabilities um, included lung cancer survival, non-lung cancer survival, um, diabetes complications, um, as well as quality of life. And um, these are the preliminary results that we, we found. So, um, you know, I, um, 
looked at patients with diabetes with no major complications, as well as um, patients with diabetes with more than one major complication. And major complication and complications included severe retinopathy, um, renal failure, stroke, myocardial infarction, and lower extremity amputation. And with um, you know the model we're working on, we're going to you know hopefully stratify by A1C and you know and you know this is you know very rudimentary breakdown of, of diabetes, um, but you know we we're hoping and we're working on um, you know more nuanced um, categories of diabetes control. Um, we, um, our output um, was simulated quality adjusted life expectancy, which is a measure that takes into account both quantity and quality of life. And for patients um, with diabetes and no major complications, um, survival was longer with chemotherapy. And in um, patients with more than one major complication, um, life expectancy was longer with observation. So the optimal strategy in the first group was adjuvant chemotherapy and the optimal therapy in this group is um, observation, which is different from um, regular lung cancer guidelines. Um, so in summary, simulation modeling leverages existing data to provide potentially helpful clinical recommendations and guidance for patients who are understudied in clinical trials. Um, I'm now going on to discuss how diabetes affects cancer mortality. Um, this table is um, from a study from the Emerging Risk Factors Collaboration from, um, it's now from um, a while ago, um, but this um, showed individual participant data um, on more than 800,000 patients. And in general, um, there is an increased risk of um, cancer mortality for a variety of cancer types. And I'm not going to dwell on the specific types, but I just wanna say that um, the increased mortality isn't generally due to cancer specific mortality, but more that diabetes has a greater impact on mortality in general um, and overall survival. Um, worse diabetes control is associated with worse cancer survival. Um, this was a, a study looking at 3,000 survivors of early stage breast cancer who were observed for a median of 10 years. Um, higher baseline A1C was associated with um, an increased um, number of deaths and um, higher hemoglobin A1C category with an A1C greater than 7% or uncontrolled diabetes was um, associated um, with worse overall survival as you can see here by the yellow line. Um, I'm now going to talk about how cancer um, affects diabetes. I just um, spent a lot of time talking about this pathway, but um, cancer does um, affect diabetes in many ways as well. Patients with cancer are more likely to develop diabetes than patients without cancer. Um, this was um, a study coming out of Korea and showing that um, patients with cancer were more um, likely um, to develop um, diabetes. So this on the y-axis here is cumulative incidence of diabetes. Um, the hazard ratio was 1.36. Um, this figure here is also from the same study and uh, the um, x-axis axis is time and years. And, um, and this figure is um, showing that the excess risk for um, diabetes after cancer development was really higher in the first two years after cancer diagnosis. Um, there are a couple issues with this study. You know, there could be a surveillance bias where, you know, these patients are being, you know, more rigorously screened for diabetes. And also, I don't believe this study controls for cancer treatments um, like steroids that may um, impact um, diabetes and glycemic control. Um, but regardless, um, a lot of other studies um, show very similar trends. Um, so why do patients with cancer um, potentially develop diabetes more frequently than patients without? So one is stress hyperglycemia and cancer cachexia is also known to be an insulin resistant state. And I think this, this figure um, from a review, I think nicely summarizes um, some, of, um, some of the reasons why cancer may um, cause uh, or worsen diabetes. So 
Uh, so um, cancer um, can um, cause neuroendocrine alterations like increased cortisol level, decreased testosterone, as well as increased catecholamines that can um, lead to insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. Cancer um, is also an inflammatory state that may um, worsen hyperglycemia. And all of these things can lead to increased insulin resistance, as I mentioned. And then this is in the context of um, patients with cancer just having traditional risk factors for diabetes and insulin res resistance, including older age, um, obesity, as well as the metabolic syndrome. Um, I also, um, cancer also affects diabetes through cancer treatments. Um, I want to highlight a few cancer treatments um, that can cause hyperglycemia and worsen diabetes. I'm only going to talk about three, um, but there are many others that can also um, cause hyperglycemia. So the first I want to briefly discuss are the PI3 kinase and mTOR inhibitors. The PI3 kinase inhibitors um, include alpelizib, um, um, which is used in breast cancer, as well as adalicib, which is used in CLL and mTOR inhibitors um, uh, include everolimus, which um, is used in breast cancer as well. Um, hyperglycemia can occur um, twelve um, can occur in twelve to fifty percent of patients on these drugs, and these drugs can both increase insulin resistance and impair insulin secretion. I next just want to mention antiestrogens and antiandrogens. Antiestrogens like tamoxifen are very commonly used in breast cancer, and antiandrogens are very commonly used for prostate cancer, which are both. Um, so, because the breast and prostate cancer are among the most common cancers um, in the US, we're, we see the use of these drugs quite frequently. Um, and I just want to note that these drugs are associated with a higher diabetes risk as well as weight, length, weight gain and insulin resistance. So it's just something to keep an eye on um, in patients on these drugs. And um, next, I want to talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors include the PD-1, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors like pembrolizumab, as well as the CTLA-4 inhibitors like ipilimumab. And these drugs are now being used more and more for all different sorts of malignancies. And they were approved back in 2011 for melanoma, and now they're being used in, um, for more and more indications as the years go on. Um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are associated with an autoimmune diabetes, which occurs in about um, up to 1% of patients, uh, maybe a little less. And I just wanna focus on immune checkpoint inhibitors for a moment and discuss them a bit more. Um, so I'm going to give a very simplistic overview of the mechanism of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors block inhibitory signals on immune cells. And these checkpoints are in place um, to block um, immune cells from attacking healthy cells in the body. So examples of these are CTLA-4 um, and PD-1 and PD-L1. And blocking these pathways results in T cell activation, which then augments immune responses against cancer cells. And in addition to activating the immune system against cancer cells, immune checkpoint inhibitors can also induce an, an immune response um, to host cells, which leads to immune mediated adverse events um, like diabetes, um, which I just mentioned. Um, the, as an endocrinologist, um, these side effects are um, very relevant to us because actually the co most common um, side effects from immune checkpoint inhibitors are endocrine related, um, particularly thyroid disease. In regard to immune checkpoint inhibitor related diabetes, um, they're more common with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, and the average onset is about four months after treatment. However, um, this um, diabetes can occur any time um, after initiating treatment to up to a year after um, stopping treatment. Um, uh, immune checkpoint mediated diabetes classically presents with a sudden onset of severe symptomatic hyperglycemia. And, um, and patients who have immune checkpoint inhibitor mediated um, autoimmune diabetes have low and or undetectable C peptide levels. And this means that these patients um, have um, low or non-existent insulin production, 
um, like in type one diabetes. And um, autoantibodies um, are positive in two thirds of patients. And um, these are the uh, um, autoantibodies associated with type one diabetes, like GAD65. Um, the long-term treat treatment for um, this complication is insulin. So it's the same treatment um, as for type one diabetes. And, you know, so far, um, it doesn't, it looks like this is a permanent side effect. Um, so far, there haven't been any cases of recovery of um, autoimmune diabetes in the setting of immune checkpoint inhibitors. Um, in my practice as an endocrinologist, I see many patients um, receiving cancer therapy as well as immunotherapy who become hyperglycemic but don't have a fulminant um, autoimmune type 1 diabetes picture. Um, I was curious about characterizing um, the hyperglycemia in these patients further, particularly like may perhaps if there was maybe a more intermediate autoimmune diabetes. Um, we looked at prevalence of post immune checkpoint inhibitor hyperglycemia in patients with and without pre existing diabetes um, in a cohort um, from Mount Sinai who received um, immunotherapy. Um, and um, and uh, hyperglycemia was defined as a random glucose above 200 since we were looking at retrospective data and we didn't know if um, the glucoses were fasting or not. So we just assumed that they weren't and used a threshold of 200. Um, in patients who had diabetes, um, uh, two thirds of them had hyperglycemia um, after initi initiating um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. In patients without diabetes, 16% um, of patients had hyperglycemia um, after starting immunotherapy. Uh, and um, I, we didn't have, um, in this cohort, there was only one case of potential autoimmune diabetes, so this patient didn't have antibodies and much follow-up after. Um, they did get have DKA, so we're not really sure. This may have been one case, but there were no other cases of autoimmune diabetes that we were aware of. And actually, you know, and we looked back and we um, tried to figure out why are these patient, patients getting hyperglycemia? And two thirds of these patients were becoming hyperglycemia, uh, hyperglycemic um, because they were re receiving um, high dose steroids with their cancer treatment. And then the rest um, really just had worsening of their type two diabetes for whatever reason. So I, I wanna highlight that hyperglycemia with immune checkpoint inhibitors is really a spectrum of disease and that the majority of patients who are hyperglycemic um, on these therapies, um, are, are, it's usually from glucocorticoids or um, worsening of their type two diabetes. And then in rare cases, you get um, the autoimmune type one diabetes, um, also autoimmune pancreatitis as well um, as a very rare lipodystrophy syndrome that's associated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. I now just, uh, I now wanna talk a little bit about glucocorticoids and hyperglycemia. Um, glucocorticoids are very frequently used um, at, in cancer patients. Um, they're actually um, part of many chemotherapy protocols to prevent um, some side effects like nausea. And they're also always used in um, patients who have neurologic um, malignancy or um, metastasis to the brain or the spinal cord. And um, in, um, in retrospective studies, the prevalence of hyperglycemia in cancer treatment is um, 11 to 18% um, with steroids. Uh, glucocorticoids can um, cause hyperglycemia in a number of different ways. And so this is relevant, not just to cancer patients, but also patients who are receiving um, steroids for um, other conditions as well. Um, so uh, glucocorticoid glucocorticoids can increase um, hepatic gluconeogenesis and also um, insulin resistance. They um, reduce um, um, insulin levels from the pancreas. There's a reduced incretin effect. Um, there's also um, decreased glucose uptake by the muscle and, and also um, increased lipolysis, which um, exacerbates insulin resistance. So um, in, for patients with diabetes who are getting high dose steroids um, for their cancer treatment, um, you know, I, I recommend um, checking postprandial blood sugars. So um, uh, glucocorticoids um, 
tend to increase postprandial blood sugars and not fasting blood sugars. So if you're just checking fasting blood sugars, you may miss some of the hyperglycemia. Um, patients with diabetes who are receiving high dose steroids with their cancer treatment should be counseled on the potential for elevated blood sugars and also the potential need to escalate antihyperglycemic therapy. And antihyperglycemic therapy will depend on steroid treatment duration and overall goals of care. So I've now um, given you know, a whirlwind review of how diabetes affects cancer and also how cancer affects diabetes. And I just wanna highlight some conclusions. Patients with diabetes have a higher risk of many cancers and increased mortality risk from cancer. Patients with diabetes have unique considerations that change the risk benefit balance of cancer therapies. Um, and uh, there's an increased risk of future diabetes for patients with cancer. Um, certain cancer therapies also promote diabetes risk in hyperglycemia. Um, and um, I just want to mention some um, future directions. So um, we, there's further research needed on the impact of antihyperglycemic drugs in conjunction with cancer treatments. Um, and also um, future re research includes what I'm working on simulation modeling to or clinical trials to optimize therapies in patients with diabetes and cancer. Um, I think we can make an argument that adequate diabetes screening and monitoring in, in patients receiving cancer uh, that we need um, adequate diabetes screening as well as monitoring in patients receiving cancer therapies associated with hyperglycemia. And um, we need improved diabetes management resources during cancer treatment. Um, I would like to acknowledge my mentors and advisors who have been helping me with grant applications as well as my research. Um, I wanna thank the T32 program in cancer control and prevention. Um, the Division of Endocrinology and Department of Medicine, who have always been very, very supportive, and um, the Agena Physician Scientist Award, which um, supports my research time. Um, I'm now happy to take questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lear. There are some questions in the chat. Um, I think I, I know them. Um, I can help you with them. So yeah, you want me to read them? I'll read them. So has anyone looked at the effect of type one diabetes in patients with cancer in any of the aspects you discussed with type two? Is it insulin resistance a marker for an abnormal immune system? And is the real problem the diabetes or the immune problem? Um, that's a great question. And I actually, I was going to include a slide on type one diabetes and, and didn't end up doing it. I, I'm actually showing it here because I have some extra slides at the end, I didn't include at first. So um, what's interesting with type one diabetes, um, overall that there's not as much of a signal with type one diabetes and cancer risk. Um, there's more of a signal in women. So women who have type one diabetes have a marginally elevated increased cancer incidence. Um, and um, there is some signal for increased risk of these types of cancers. Um, but what I thought was so interesting, there was a study that showed that really um, the increased risk of cancer was in the, the first year after being diagnosed with um, type one diabetes. And I'm not sure if this is a, um, you know, sort of, um, an ascertainment bias issue where once someone gets diagnosed with time, type one, they're more likely to you know, get screened for cancers or if, you know, in the year leading up to type one diabetes diagnosis, um, you know, patients are more hyperglycemic and that may be driving things. So it's hard to, um, it's hard to say, but there definitely, is, there's not as much of um, a signal. And regarding um, insulin resistance, um, it can be a marker of an abnormal immune system. There's a lot of crosstalk um, in, you know, if, if you recall the figure I put up, there's a lot of crosstalk between fat, um, you know, um, fat cells, um, and fat, you know, adipose tissue does create, a, um, a lot of, um, um, a lot of inflammatory markers. And so they are very much interrelated. And I think, um, you know, this isn't my area of expertise, um, but you know, there definitely is, um, it's hard to, uh, there is, there are immune system issues with diabetes and insulin resistance, and it's hard to know if it's the diabetes or the, 
um, immune system. But I think there's compelling preclinical evidence to show that really both play a role. Great. The next question is related, so I'll go beyond that. Um, are, it was the same one, actually, almost. Are there interventional studies looking at various diabetes treatments, either lowering insulin, hyperinsulinemia, versus adding exogenous insulin, lowering hemoglobin A1C and weight? Um, yeah, hi, Dr. Coben. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I didn't get into can the diabetes treatments very much, but there's been a lot of, um, a lot of interest in metformin um, for cancer. And so there's a lot of compelling preclinical evidence that metformin um, reduces tumor cell growth and also um, epidemiologic data as well. Um, and so there's actually, actually now been quite a few clinical trials with metformin um, in conjunction with cancer treatments. And, it, you know, there ha the clinical trial data hasn't been as impressive as the epidemiologic data, but there has been some improvement in the early stage cancer setting. So, you know, like polyps and colon cancer or early stage breast cancer, there is some if there is some um, benefit in progression with metformin and we're really not seeing that in more um, advanced or metastatic um, cancers. Um, and there haven't been really great interventional studies, you know, looking at lowering A1, um, A1C. Um, and then in regards to weight, we ha actually had a, a speaker for our endocrine grand rounds last week um, who is now conducting clinical trials on weight management in patients with cancer. and. Um, and it doesn't look like there's results yet, but she's at least shown it's feasible. And I think it will be really interesting to see how um, that impacts insulin resistance and, and cancer progression. Nice. Next one starts off, Amanda, with uh, very interesting. Thank you. I wonder any studies assessed cancer cell anaerobic glycolysis capacities? Was it different between different cancers or similar? Um, so this... Um, this is not my area of expertise, and I, you know, I will defer to my laboratory colleagues, hopefully, uh, on this topic, because I'm not sure. I know that this, I'm pretty sure it has been studied, and, you know, different cancer types are studied in the laboratory, and I think there has been some, you know, controversy about the Warburg effect, because it isn't the case for all cancers, but I don't have much detail um, beyond that. How about... Um... <clears throat> There's a, a common question. Also, some anti-diabetic therapies reduce risk of cancer and cancer aggressiveness, like metformin, the activation of AMP kinases. Yeah, so I think I, I touched on that um, a little bit with um, talking about metformin. So metformin is really the um, the anti-diabetic um, therapy we have the most data on, and there's now been some interest in SGL. SGLT2 inhibitors because in, in lab studies, um, the SGLT2 pathway is involved in, um, in some, uh, for, especially for lung cancer, SGLT2, um, you know, as in, in inhibition has shown decreased lung cancer growth, but we don't have any clinical studies in that regard. Any other questions? Otherwise, we got two great talks, exclamation points in the uh, in the chat for you, Amanda. So, uh, Dr. Leader, uh, from Dr. Gallagher and Dr. Coleman. Thank you. It looks like the end of the questions. I would agree. It was a wonderful talk. It was very terrific to see to see your work and to see you progress now from internship all the way up here to be now faculty member for the department. So. Thank you very much for all that you're doing and, uh, and uh, thanks for coming to Grand Rounds. Um, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Have a nice day, everybody. Enjoy the day. Bye. See you, Amanda. Take it easy. Thanks, Emily.